Let's take our Bibles this morning and open up with me to the book of Titus chapter 2. Titus chapter 2, the story is told about a gardener uh, in a large estate in northern Italy. And he was conducting a visitor through the castle and the grounds, and just the grounds were absolutely beautiful to look at. Uh, So well manicured, everything was absolutely perfect and in its place, and Uh, The visitor was able to have lunch with the gardener, and so as they were sitting there talking, uh, they asked the gardener, they says, well, how long have you been doing this job? And he told him for how many years, and uh, he said, well, how long has it been since the last time that the owner was here? And he says, it's been 10 years ago. And so the visitor says, well, why in the world then do you keep this place so immaculate and such a just beautiful surroundings. And he says, well, because I'm expecting him to return. And so the visitor says, well, is he coming next week? And he says, I, the gardener says, I don't know. And he says, well, as he said, when he's coming? He says, no. He says, I'm just expecting him today. I'm expecting him today. That's why he kept the garden looking so well. Do you and I really expect Jesus Christ to come back today? We know He's coming back, right? And we know that it could be at any time, right? But do we really expect that Jesus Christ could come back today? And are we preparing our hearts for that? Are we living in such a way that we are looking for Christ's return? This series that we are in from the book of Titus, we have spent nearly 10 weeks looking at one chapter. You say, I know. It has been a very thorough search of this chapter. The reason that it should be so thorough, though, is because that is a chapter that is dealing with the preparation for the Master to come. We don't know when the Master is going to come. We just know that we've got to be ready. We have got to be keeping the garden pristine. We've got to be keeping it clean. We've got to keep it well manicured and groomed. And what we have been looking at is the job that the elder people within the church have to help those who are younger to get that garden in order. And the reason that the elder have to help the younger do this is because it is more predominantly the elder that are really looking for Christ's return. I've shared before because a lot of times in the younger mind, it's not that they're not, you know, super spiritual like the aged. It's not that they are so... It's just a fact that our minds, the younger that we are, and I've shared with you before that I knew that the Lord as a kid was coming back at any time, but I wanted to go to Cedar Point first. Um, and that's just the way a younger mind is thinking. You're going, Lord, I don't think there's roller coasters in heaven. I want to experience it once. And some of the younger are saying, you know, I'd like to get married. I'd like to have a family. I'd like to have children. I'd like to finish my education. I would like to do all these things that are totally normal, natural, fine things to do. But the older you get, doesn't heaven look sweeter? And the things that we have lived through, we say, God, I don't want to go through that again. In our youth, we look forward to it. Now we're going, I don't want to turn that clock back. I don't want to return to that. I'm ready to go home. I am ready for the next big thing. And so the elder, that's why they get the job. Besides the fact that they've had time, they've had experience, they've had all the bumps to learn through the ages to pass that wisdom down to the younger. And that's the job that we have to do. Uh, In Titus chapter 2, I want us to just reread the verses of Scripture before we get into today's message. Titus chapter 2 starting in verse 1, But speak thou the things which become sound doctrine, that the aged men be sober, grave, temperate, sound in faith, in charity and patience, that the aged women likewise, that they be in behavior as becometh holiness, not false accusers, not given to much wine, teachers of good things, that they may teach the young women to be sober, to love their husbands, to love their children, to be discreet, chase, keepers at home. That's where we stopped last Sunday night. That's where we are going to begin this Sunday morning. As we looked at this last Sunday night, I said that our, our idea of the gender roles. Now, we recognize that in our society today, there is a lot of gender confusion. 
Before there was gender confusion, there was gender role confusion. Two different things. Today, people don't know what they are. And in years gone by, they knew what they were, but they didn't know what they were supposed to do. And so there was all this gender confusion and, and the gender role confusion. Today, many of our homes are not structured biblically because we have taken our cues of what the role of a man should be, what the role of a woman should be. We have taken it not from the Bible. We have taken it from our culture. We have taken it from what has been displayed on television. We have taken it from what the loudest voices who are marching around with their picket signs and, and protesting and all that kind of stuff. We have taken our cues from them, not from the Bible. Well, listen, folks, if we want our homes to be God-honoring, to be the homes that God wants them to be, we've got to recognize that there are gender roles to be played. God's the one that said how they are to be played and it is not up to us to tweak it. God knew what was best. He knew what was the right way to do things. I know a lot of times Christians squirm over that, and especially what we see here where we talked about last week that the women are to be keepers at home. God's role, God's design for the woman, and the phrasing means she is to be domestically inclined. The aged women are to teach the younger how to be domestically inclined. Housewife, that is an old term, but there's an older term that I like even better because it really tells what this means, homemaker. Ladies, do you recognize that it is your, your role of your gender, according to the Bible, to be the homemaker? You're the one that makes it home. That is your job. That is your responsibility. That is your God-given privilege to make it home. Turn back with me. Keep your marker here in Titus. Turn back to the book of Proverbs with me. I said last Sunday evening the Proverbs chapter 31 is often avoided because ladies will say, oh, the virtuous woman, who could live up to that? And I don't think that is a fair way to look at this. I don't believe that the virtuous woman talked about here in Proverbs 31 is some, some, some person that is beyond any possibilities, but rather is there as a role model. It is an aged woman who is serving as a model, as an example. It says in Proverbs 31, verse 10, Who can find a virtuous woman? For her price is far above rubies. The heart of her husband doth safely trust in her, so that he shall have no need of spoil. Verse 27, she looketh well to the ways of her household, and eateth not the bread of idleness. Her children arise up, and call her blessed. Her husband also, and he praiseth her. If you are in the younger category, you may be resisting this. Maybe some in the aged category are saying, I'm resisting it too. Well, I would encourage you to realize that when you look at the job that the wife has of being the homemaker... That does not mean that you're a prisoner in that house. It doesn't mean that those four walls are your jail cell and you cannot get out of that jail. Rather, what the verse does, it establishes the priority of your life. And your priority, the number one job that you have, is to make it a home. You may say, well, that's outdated and old-fashioned. God's Word is never outdated and old-fashioned. God's Word is as relevant today as the day that the words were penned on that original parchment. Ladies, the Bible, that whole phrase about being the homemaker, the, the one that is taking care of the home, it literally means you are the guardian of the home life. And then we saw what the Apostle Paul told Timothy. The Apostle Paul told Timothy that you are the oikodespotes. You're the house despot. How about you get a title badge that says, gives your name, house despot. You're in charge of the home life. That is your job. Now let's notice some more teachings in Titus chapter 2, verse 5, the next thing. The aged women are to teach the younger women to be good. To be good. And oh boy, that right there may set some on, on their heels. What do you mean teaching me to be good? I am good. 
<laughs> it is, don't think of it in that sense. Think of the word as kindness. The aged are to show the younger women how to act in kind ways, to do kind things. Thayer's Greek Dictionary gives further definition of the word. It says to be of a good constitution or nature, useful, salutary, good, pleasant, agreeable, joyful, happy, excellent, distinguished, upright, honorable. As God's workmanship, you are to be a kind individual. Remember in the book of Ephesians, the Bible tells us that we are supposed to be kind, tender-hearted, forgiving one another, and all those kinds of things. That is what we are called to do, ladies. That is your job, according to the qualification that's given here. But it is also a qualification for every single Christian, regardless of your gender. God has called us to be good. How many times did you tell your kids when they went out of the house, now you be good? And, and that word, when you told them to be good, meant a lot of things, didn't it? And when God says to the older women, teach the younger women to be good, that carries a lot of weight to it. Let's go back to the book of Ephesians chapter 2. Ephesians chapter 2. We know what we have in verses 8 and 9, where the Bible tells us that we are saved by grace through faith, that not of yourselves is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. So works have absolutely nothing to do whatsoever with our salvation. But verse 10, for we are His workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto what? Good works. God made us to do good works. Not to get us right with God, not to get us saved, not to get us a home in heaven. We do the good because we are saved. And in fact, we do the good only because we're saved. Remember what the Bible says about our good works pre-salvation? They're filthy rags. The, the works cannot even become good until after we've been saved. And then the works can become good. And then we can get involved in the works that God has given us to do. And, and to do those things for the honor and the glory of the Lord. So older ladies, you are to teach the younger women... Be good. Do the good. Do the kind things. I love how J.B. Phillips puts this in his commentary. He says, older women can teach younger women to be good. The word is sometimes used to describe the absolute essential goodness of God. The idea of kindness is included in the word, as is the concept of being good-natured. Thus, one rendering of the word is kind-hearted. A woman's role is to make her home a refuge from all the mean-spiritedness, the callousness, the cruelty, and the wickedness so often encountered in the outside world. Her husband often has to deal with the evil of the workday. Her children have to battle it at school. And I love this phrase. When husband and children come home, home should seem like a suburb of heaven. From the divine standpoint, that is the glory of being a wife and a mother, nothing else compares with it. Now, I know some of our ladies, you're getting all testy with me. You get a little testy with the Lord. And you're going, well, I've had a hard day too. I work with those evil, wicked people in the world. Didn't say you didn't. What I'm saying is, this is God's priority for you, ladies, this is your God-given job, not your husband-given job, not your pastor-given job. This is your God-given job to make your house a home, a suburb of heaven. I love that phrase. Have you ever stopped to think, you go to a huge city, and there's all sorts of suburbs all around the city with different names. And around the city of heaven is the suburb of our home. And around the city of heaven is the suburb, should be the suburb of our church. And the suburb of Christian fellowship. Man, it, one day we're going to move into the heart of the city, but it's awful nice to live in the burbs, isn't it? I just, I love that phrase. That came from the 19, early 1980s before J.B. Phillips died. We are to be living in the suburbs of heaven right now. 
And if it's not the suburb of heaven in your home, ladies, get it there. Now, gentlemen, kids, the wife and the mother, she is the homemaker. She's the one that is supposed to make it a home. She is the one who is the oikodespotes. She's the house despot. Don't come home with your stinking attitude, your gripes and your grumbles and foul mood and mess it up. Amen? Don't mess it up. She's worked hard to get it there. Support that. You come home and you've walked into the suburb and don't... Don't take it out to the sticks. Don't turn your suburb into a, a, a poverty-ridden area. Keep it the suburb that she's made it. Ooh, isn't that good? Ladies, that is your role that God has given you. Now, I know our ladies are thinking, when are you going to get off our backs and get on the guys' backs? Well, we'll start that tonight. Half of you will miss it. <laughs> Just saying. Go to Titus chapter 2, verse 5 again. If that doesn't ruffle your feathers, well, this one will. Titus 2 and verse 5 again, to be discreet, chase, keepers at home, good, obedient to their own husbands. The very first wedding I ever did as a pastor, I met with a couple, and I asked them about the vows that they wanted, because, you know, you can write your own vows, and, and when you say, well, I want the traditional vows, you wouldn't be, you'd be surprised how many versions of the traditional vows are out there. And so I says, well, here's the traditional vows, and I went through his, and I went through hers. And to obey your husband is in the traditional vows. And she says, what? <laughs> she says, I ain't saying that. I says, you said you won the traditional vows? And she says, yeah, but I'm not saying that. And it really took me aback, and I says, why not? I'm not going to obey him. Who do you think I am? Yeah, and so, so we had to have a little bit of a time in God's Word and to explain what that phrase means and what it doesn't mean. The word obedient definitely causes some people to stumble. The word literally means, though, to be willing to place yourself in a position under your husband who is the God-given authority for your family. Be in that position of being submissive. That's what the word is talking about is a willful placing of yourself. It is not going, yes, sir, whatever you say, sir, okay, and, and bowed head and, and walking several paces by. There are some, oh, I remember when we were in college, there was this couple, they had, the, the husband, he would always walk a number of paces in front of his wife, and she had to walk a number of paces behind him. And then they had children, they didn't have TV. They had kids. <laughs> and they just kept coming. That is not biblical submission. And I mean, when she snapped her fingers, when she, or excuse me, when he did, or he said, this is what I want you to do. Okay, okay. And she, he had turned her into this little sniveling thing. Folks, that is ungodly. That is absolutely contrary to what the Bible teaches. We're going to be getting into that, but let's get into it a little bit today. One commentary puts it this way. This is the word that talks about two people who are absolutely equal in God's eyes. The wife makes a choice to place herself as an equal underneath another equal, her husband in order that there can be order and function in the family. The purpose is so to meet the design that God has ordered. The word was a military term, describing soldiers lining up under their authority, and also referred to the arrangement of military implements on a battlefield in such a way as to facilitate effective warfare. God wants our homes in order. And the order that God has established is not that you have somebody that is of great status, another person of lower status, followed by a bunch of little kids that are even lower status. God sees you as equal. But this is a placement. It is a placement for purpose. Any organization 
is not going to function if it has multiple heads. It's not possible. Two-headed organizations are freakish. They're a mess. And how many homes are that way? Or the home has it out of order. And the wife says, I'm the head of this home. And the husband says, okay, dear. That's not going to work. That isn't going to work because it's not God's order. I'm not talking about my order. I'm not talking about the Baptist order. I'm talking about the Bible because that's how the Lord has established this. Let's go back to Ephesians chapter 5. Ephesians chapter 5. Now, dear lady, if you shut me off, you've tuned me out, and you said, I ain't listening to any more of this. Just come back. Rejoin me, all right? In Ephesians chapter 5, starting in verse 22, again, this is biblical. This isn't me. Wives, submit yourselves unto your own husbands as unto the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, and he is the Savior of the body. Therefore, as the church is subject unto Christ, so let wives be to their own husbands in everything. Colossians chapter 3, verse 18, reiterates the exact same thing. Ladies, this does not say, here's the good news for you, dear ladies. The verse of Scripture does not say that because you're a lady, you have to submit to every man. You submit to one. One. That's your husband. And consider what this doesn't mean. It does not mean, and in fact, when you uh, continue to read here, you go over to Ephesians chapter 6. Children, obey your parents. And then we say, well, the wives are supposed to obey their husbands. Two different words for obey are given there. The phrasing for the wife. The wife is commanded to obey her husband, but not as a child is commanded to obey their parents. The parents are to have that say over the life of their kid, and their kid is supposed to obey, period. Amen, parents? That's not the same obedience that the wife has towards her husband. Totally different word. The wife is commanded to do it, but she has free will. And, and she can say, I will not. Now, you're wrong if you do that, all right? Because that's not submitting. And, and I'm assuming that he is trying to lead biblically, godly, and all that. I'm putting it in the best categories for you. Uh, but it does not, it's not the same kind of obedience like a child has to their parent. The second thing is that some men will treat their wives like doormats walking all over them. The Bible does not allow for such dictatorial behavior. There is no right whatsoever for any husband to walk all over his wife. All right? So let's make that very, very clear, ladies. And so if you've got a husband that does walk all over you, I'm sorry, you married a twit. You married a guy that doesn't want to do what the Bible says. He thinks he's a king. He thinks he's a god. He thinks you should bow down and worship him. He's wrong. He is dead wrong. You say, well, then how do I deal with that kind of a guy? 1 Peter chapter 3. Read what 1 Peter chapter 3 has to say. Gentlemen, if you're here today, well, obviously you're here today because I'm talking to you. You don't treat your wife like a doormat. Submission in no way implies superiority of the husband over the wife in God's eyes, and it shouldn't be that way in your eyes. God's design for an orderly functioning family requires structure. Now, Gentlemen, let's kind of give you a little bit of a taste of where we're heading in the days to come, specifically tonight. You're in Ephesians chapter 5. Lest our ladies feel discouraged and think that this is all on their shoulders, I want our men to be reminded of their responsibilities. Chapter 5, verse 25. Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it. Verse 28. So ought men to love their wives as their own bodies. He that loveth his wife loveth himself. For no man ever yet hated his own flesh, but nourisheth and cherisheth it, even as the Lord the church. Verse 33, Nevertheless, let every one of you in particular so love his wife, even as himself, and the wife see that she reverence her husband. One more, let's go to 1 Peter chapter 3. 
First Peter chapter 3, verse 7. We saw this verse about three weeks ago. We'll look at it again. The Bible says in 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 7, Likewise, ye husbands, dwell with them according to knowledge, giving honor unto the wife as unto the weaker vessel, and as being heirs together of the grace of life, that your prayers be not hindered. Gentlemen, you have a tremendous responsibility to your wife. It is more than just making sure that the needs financially of the home are provided for. It is more than just making sure the oil in the car is changed. It is more than just making sure that the grass is mowed and all that kind of stuff is done. Your responsibilities that you have to your wife, biblically speaking, is to love her, to care for her, to be gentle with her, to treat her with love, dignity, respect, honor. To remember, the Bible says she's the weaker vessel, and to treat her as such. That's your responsibilities, gentlemen. Now, think about this for a minute. Any man that will treat the woman that way, what woman wouldn't say, I would love to submit to this just this, one man. And for the godly biblical order to be established in the home. And when you read the scriptures in Ephesians chapter 5, it does not say, well, I'll do it if he does it, or I'll do it if she does it. You do what you're supposed to do, period. Why? Because it's the role that God gave you in your gender to play. Plain and simple. Gentlemen, does your wife know does she really know that you love her second only to the Lord? Does she really know that? You say, well, yeah, I told her I loved her on her wedding day. If anything changes, I'll tell her. <laughs> no. Does she know? Does she feel safe and secure in your love? Does she feel cherished? Does she feel honored? If we were to ask your wife, what was the last special thing that your husband did for you? Number one, could she remember it? And number two, when was it? You say, well, last romantic holiday was February 14th. Yep, did something. Because I knew if the thing was asked at church, I'd look terrible if I didn't. Or you say, well, I covered it on Mother's Day. Why are you looking for a holiday to do it? you got 365 days in a, in a year. Which one of those days, other than a holiday, remove all the holidays, remove any romantic holiday, remove her birthday. Remo you better not forget it, though. Remove her birthday. Remove um, your anniversary. Those are the duh, no-brainers, you better come through days. It's the other days that count. What was the last thing you did? When was it? And is it something that she could even remember? You say, man, I don't have that much money in my billfold. Who says you had to spend a penny to do something special? Who says that you had, how much does it take for you to sit and write her a note? And maybe you left early in the morning and so you knew exactly where she would go to put her makeup on and fix herself all up for the day. And so you left first and you just put a little note there for her. Aww. You mean people still do that? Well, people that are in love. You know, people that want to keep fire and fan in the flame. There's all sorts of things that you can do that's not going to cost you a penny. It has nothing to do with your billfold. In fact, that's, using the billfold is kind of the cheap way to get out of it. It's like, here, I bought something. Well, that's not necessarily the way to their heart. When was the last time, gentlemen, you said, I'm cooking supper tonight? Now, maybe you can only, you know, boil hot dogs and water kind of thing and you're told don't touch the microwave. You blow things up. So maybe you're incredibly limited in what you can fix, but you still say, it'll be the best bowl of cereal we ever had. 
You can put a little flour beside it. You can serve it nice. You can find where the best china bowls are at and put that, that scoop of Lucky Charms or Fruit Loops in it and put the milk on it and everything else. You can make that look special and say, just wanted to do something special for you. Gentlemen, that's our job. Go back to Titus chapter 2, though. We've got to finish this out. Why is all this so important? Why is it so important that the aged teach the younger, and as we're looking at right now very specifically, the aged women teaching the younger women, tonight the aged men teaching the younger men, why is it so important that we get the garden looking great and keep it looking great because the master of the castle is going to return at any minute? Why is it so important? Titus chapter 2, the last part of verse 5 says that we do this, that the Word of God be not blasphemed. So that the Word of God be not blasphemed. Go back with me to 2 Samuel chapter 12. When I think about the word blaspheme and blasphemy, I think more of words being said, specific words, or speaking something that is directly inflammatory or derogatory against God. However, blasphemy can come and and probably does come more often this way than in any other way, and it's the blaspheming of God's names that Christians do the most. Now, I don't know too many Christians that are out using God's name in vain and cursing God's name, but does that mean that Christians don't blaspheme the name of God? Well, let's look at this, 2 Samuel chapter 12, starting in verse 11. Nathan has come to rebuke David after David's sin. And it says in verse 11, Thus saith the Lord, Behold, I will raise up evil against thee out of thine own house, and I will take thy wives before thine eyes, and give them unto thy neighbor, and he shall lie with thy wives in the sight of the sun. For thou didst it secretly, but I will do this thing before all Israel and before the sun. And David said unto Nathan, I have sinned against the Lord. And Nathan said unto David, The Lord also hath put away thy sin, thou shalt not die. How be it? Because by this deed thou hast given great occasion to the enemies of the Lord to blaspheme. The child also that is born unto thee shall surely die. To our knowledge, David did not curse God. David did not slander God with his mouth, saying, Uh, derogatory, condemnatory kinds of comments against God. David didn't do that. David didn't do any of them kind of things. Instead, David caused the nations around Israel to blaspheme by disobedience. You know, David disobeyed God's Word in so many ways. Things that David would have known. Exodus 20, 17 condemns lust by stating that a person is not to covet his neighbor's wife. Exodus 20, 14 says, thou shalt not commit adultery. Exodus 20, 13 says, thou shalt not kill. And Numbers 32, 23 says, be sure your sin will find you out. And David blasphemed through his disobedience. David's the leader of Israel. God's people, God's chosen nation. David ought to be setting the pattern of obedience, but because he disobeyed the Word of God, the other nations are looking and saying, see, God's Word doesn't mean anything. Who is this powerful God? What good is this powerful God? Even his own people can get away with sins that the lost world knows you shouldn't do. The lost world knows you shouldn't commit adultery. The lost world knows you shouldn't lust. The lost world knows that you shouldn't kill. And yet here's one of God's own people. Look what he did. And they blaspheme God. God says, David, we've got to remove the blasphemy. I've got to show these people that I am God. And it costs dearly. When we have high talk and a low walk, 
it causes people to blaspheme. High talk. Oh, we can talk a great Christian talk. We can say how much we're looking forward to Jesus Christ coming back. How much we go to love church. Oh, I read my Bible all the time. I pray all the time. I do this. I do this. I, 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 I. That's high talk. But we have a low walk. We're not living it. The world blasphemes God. And if our home is not ordered and structured God's way, and if our home, you know, what a testimony of the smallest unit of people that can actually stomach to live together day in and day out. And if our home is not structured God's way, and if our home is not reflecting the joys and the blessings that God intended for our home to enjoy, the lost world looks at it and blasphemes. Why in the world would anybody want a nuclear family? Why we can just have shack-up situations. We can just have two guys or two girls living together. We can create any kind of family we want. What's the big deal? We can't do any worse than them Christians doing what they say is the, what the Bible says. And the world blasphemes. The 19th century German philosopher Heinrich Heine said, show me your redeemed life and I might, I might be inclined to believe in your Redeemer. There is no indication that he ever did. And there is no indication that, that a lot of people in this world ever do. From Titus this morning, I ask us as believers in Christ, is our home in order, or do we need to get it in order? Is our life in order, or do we need to get it in order? Is our life a witness and a testimony of obedience to God's Word, or is it a life and a testimony that says, well, I don't always follow the Lord as closely. I've got a better way. I'm going to skirt the issue. I'm going to do my own thing, because it's going to work better in the culture in which we live. What kind of home do we have? Will we allow this invitation time to make the difference in our life, Christian? Will we beg God, if our home is not in order, to show us how to get it in order? And if our home is in order, to show us how to protect it? Because just because your home is in order today doesn't mean it'll be in order tomorrow. Satan is out there to attack your home. And if he can destroy your home, it'll ripple right down and it'll destroy your church. It'll destroy your work. It'll destroy everything if your home can get destroyed. God help us to protect our homes. Maybe you're here today and you don't know Jesus Christ as your Savior. Before you can get your home in order, you got to get your life in order. You can't get the big things, and home's a big thing, right? Church is an even bigger thing, right? You can't get those things in order until your life is right and in order. And that's where it begins. Look at your heart today. Can you say honestly, beyond any shadow of a doubt, that you have received Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior? Can you point to the moment when you were born again and Jesus changed you? Can you point to that? If not... How about you point to today, June the 5th, 2022, and you say, this is the day that I've given my life to Jesus. He came into this world because you're a sinner. And not, I'm not pointing a finger at you. We're all sinners. Jesus came into this world for all of us. But Jesus also came into this world. If you were the only one, he would have come for you because he loves you. And he died on that cross. He took the, the punishment for your sin. And he shed his blood. He was buried in the tomb and he arose again from the grave. And he still loves you. He still wants to have a relationship with you. But you must call on the name of the Lord to be saved. Will this be the day? Stand with me, please, with our heads bowed and our eyes closed. Father, this morning... We want you to have your way with our life. 
as an individual, as a home, as a church, as a city, and on up, Lord, as it grows, we want you to have your way with us. As believers, may we look at our life and begin getting things in order if they aren't, or once again, recommit those things to you. And then, Lord, we pray for that lost soul, that this would be the day of salvation for them. Have your way, Lord, with us today, in Jesus' name.